companion on my right, of course, uh, transformed the world in another way. He made it clear that you cannot have an end to poverty or the beginning of the end of poverty without credit available, however small it may be. And as a result of his vision, we now have a very familiar phrase in the world called microfinancing, small amounts of money that allow people at the very bottom of the economic scale to have new hope and to have an understanding of how a free market works and how they can take advantage of it. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you a man who gave a new respectability to the profession of banking, Muhammad Yunus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very honored to be able to address this distinguished gathering. I'm not a, a politician. I'm not a world leader. Uh, I work with the poor people in a poor country, Bangladesh. But the ceremony that we attended yesterday is always uh, uh, represented a very significant symbolic value for me. And I was very delighted that I could participate in the 20th anniversary of that uh, uh, fall of Berlin Wall, such a symbolic event that uh, shaped my thinking uh, in a way that I do. I often refer to fall of Berlin Wall uh, in different contexts. And I'll share some of this with you, uh, why I feel this is such a significant event in the world history. First thing, I mention this because what a dreadful wall, what a horrifying wall could be brought down in a, such a peaceful, joyful way. People joining in, carrying their children on the back and chipping away the wall. It's a fantastic image in anybody's mind. Problem may be terrible, horrible, but it could be torn down if people want to do that. And that's what happened in this Berlin Wall. That's why it occupies such an important position in my mind. Second reason why it uh, <clears throat> kind of occupies my mind, I give example, nobody could predict it. And we keep hearing the leaders were involved in the uh, highest positions in the countries were involved in this didn't know about it. Even three months before the fall, President Gorbachev repeated it today also. He was saying it may happen in the 21st century, which will happen in three months. And none of the wise analysts around the world in all the think tanks couldn't come up with any hint of something like that could happen. So that brings sense to us how little we know. We cannot see even right in front of our nose what's going to happen. And it's not the only thing that we did, that we didn't know that the Berlin Wall will fall, Soviet Union will disintegrate, Cold War will be over, we had no picture of that. It just happened on its own burden, on its own way. It just uh, rushed through. And it tells something about how we make our judgments. We make judgment about things we project will happen, didn't happen. We didn't know about things which will happen, did happen. That humbles us, that we should be ready for that kind of eventuality. We didn't predict internet will be a household thing, not household, is in a personal pocket thing. We didn't realize that there will be desktops and there will be laptops, there will be palm tops, and you name it probably, pen tops or it goes on. We never predicted that. We didn't predict 
in 89 or any time, there will be something called mobile phones. Today, everybody has not one, two, three pockets carrying all kinds of message, messaging services, all kinds of services. And this is the tip of the technology of mobile phones. You, you see what happens next, but we don't know how little we know. We didn't know, know that we can talk on a sky. Today we do that. And then I go back again. If we had all these things that we have today on the technology front, on the information technology front, you have the whole list, I don't want to repeat that. In 60s, in 70s, would Berlin Wall disintegrate earlier? Because the wall which is trying to protect people, they are on the, on the, inter, on the technology side, are so close to each other. How, how difficult it would be to maintain that wall. That would be something to think. If we think it could be one year earlier, two years earlier, even five years earlier, then maybe the walls that we have in front of us, which is still standing, are not as distant as we imagine today. Because we don't know what is coming up tomorrow, no? Next year, tomorrow. So, if we have to predict a world 20 years from now, just 20 years, forget about 50 years or so, if you all bring the, all the wisest people in the world, sit down, tell us, look at your crystal ball, what is going to have 20 years from now in 2030, for example. If you project it, everything that you'll project will be useless. Because it will, be ha it will happen so different than what we project. We have to create a science fiction about 2030, if you want to come close to it at all. And you have to have wild imaginations. And then probably will come close to 2030. Why we must work in a very definitive way. This is what we are going to achieve. This is what is possible. I think it's been much better if you work, we list what are the things which are impossible. And those are the things which will happen. It's useless to predict the possible, possible cards. Because even in recent history, we saw it didn't work. If we sat down in the, uh, 1970 or 1980, predict what will be the world like in 2000, 20 years, I'm sure we'll not predict all the things that we did. If we probably try to fantasize a world, what will be in 2000, year 2000, probably will come close to what we have right now. The Berlin will not be there, there will be reunification of Germany, there will be etc., etc., and the technology will be kind of a science fiction technology. You can talk to each other, and it wouldn't cost anything to you. So I'm appealing. Let's go for the impossible. That's much, much more likely to happen and define those impossible things. And when we talk about creating a world without poverty, people say, ah, ah that's what you think. <laughs> because they find it so impossible. And I think that's what will happen if we make up our own mind. Let's work for it. Because impossible will happen anyway, whether I want it or not. Berlin Wall will fall anyway, whether our leaders work for it or not. So why don't we go for that? And power of individuals, power of joy, which tear down this wall, why don't we bring into the action? We are so worried about the security of Europe. 
what Europe will be in 2030? Does it need a security? Security against what? Whom? Do we know that world that we are preparing, is investing all this money and all that? I think that's where our starting point should be. That is, imagine that we don't have an enemy to build up the security. Because all those enemies are here, not there. If you fix up here, our security is done. Will we have that same mind today in 2009, the mind we will have in 2030? That's the issue. Would our children have this mind? Not us, we'll be done. Would our children have the same mind that we have coming from the war, coming from all the suspicion, all those stories Hollywood makes for us? So that should be the starting point. Today, we are talking about impossible. Grameen Bank was one of those impossibles. Nobody ever thought you can lend money to poor women and she will pay you back and she will change her life. Who ever thought that? But today is a global phenomenon. When all the banks, big banks are collapsing, with all their collateral, with all their lawyers, with all their big buildings, billions of dollars, not tiny change. It is the credit with the women, poorest women, $30 loan, $100 loan, $200 loan, which are paid religiously almost, clockwise, clockwork, every single day at the record of 98%, 99%, no collateral, no lawyers, nothing. Doesn't it tell us something? How smart we are designing this banking system? Couldn't make it work. Why all those lawyers anyway? So let's go for the impossible. Forget about it. The credit means trust. When we build a beautiful institution on the basis of total distrust, can't we go back to the original and build it up again? At least some people did it on the basis of trust. And it works beautifully in this financial crisis. It didn't shake, it didn't move, it moves forward. That's the story of impossible. So we prepare for the impossibles. Let's go for the impossible and get it done. Today, we are shaking with the financial crisis. And everybody is so worried because they lost so, many, so much money, millions, billions, you name it. But the entire psyche is occupied. All the political discussion is occupied. All the televisions and all the newspapers are occupied on financial crisis. But that is not the only crisis. This is a crisis that took away some money from me. That's why we're so worried. Otherwise, there's a food crisis going on. Nobody cares. People will go hungry, die. It did. It, is, it came at the same year, 2008. It's not something somebody manufactured today. Do we, have we solved that problem? Put it, no, it is not. Simply, we are not talking about it. It will happen unless we get involved with that. Energy crisis, everybody was shaking in 2008 as if it got disappeared. It didn't. And environmental crisis, global, climate change, we are just talking about going to Copenhagen and we'll negotiate. I don't understand this idea about negotiate. What are we negotiating? Our house, our home is on fire. What are we negotiating about? <laughs> a 
isn't it first thing to do, just go and stop this fire and make a commitment to all of us as we are inhabitant of this home, this planet, our common home. It's not that oh, Bangladeshis live in, in another planet, we live in another. We are not. Unfortunately, we are on the same planet. If we got drowned in Bangladesh, that doesn't mean you are safe. Simply, it has started someplace. It's coming. Because it's the same, same home. So it's our home. And the first decision to take, let's make a decision as an inhabitant of this home. They will make this home safer. And hand it over as a safer home than we found it. After all, it was handed over to us by our parents. And we want to hand it over to our children as a safer home, not a more dangerous home. Now we are making it more dangerous every day. And happily hand it over to our children, proudly. A dangerous home for you. We made it more dangerous than we found it. What an irrational way of looking at it. So that's what we should be doing. Stopping this fire, not negotiate as if something that I win from you and so on. There's nothing, no winner here. So all these things, all these crises are rooted in the same cause. That's my feeling. Single cause, a severe flaw in our structure, in our conceptual structure, in our practicing structure. In the business world, we have created a kind of human being who are given the task of making money. And we told this man or woman, make the maximum money. And that's your goal, that's your task. We, we create a game where all the players are trying to make maximum for himself and herself. So all this aggressive selfishness gets into us. In the process, we destroy each other. But that's not what real human beings are. Real human beings are not one-dimensional beings. Real human beings are multi-dimensional beings. So you kind of created a twisted human being and put it in the economic structure and played you created your own game and asked them to play that, and we are happily playing that. That caused all the problem, because all the selfishness that we have, we poured it over. But we are also selfless people. Every human being has two, at least two. There are other elements, other dimensions, but at least two. We are selfish at the, time, at the same time we are selfless. If we have even had interpreted these two aspects of human being in the business place, at least there should be a re responsible world. We would have done both. We'll create, a, we'll create the businesses, everything for others, nothing for, everything is for me, nothing for others. We would have created another kind of business where everything is for others, nothing for me. That's the selfless part. I have it, you have it. Why can't we do that? So I dared into doing that and call it social business. Now I get a very good response from young people, from very seasoned business executives, and university stu students. So we are creating a series of those social businesses. It is, these are cause-driven business. All the mess that we have created by being selfish, aggressively selfish, we go with the self, selfless business to fix it up, to address the poverty, address the malnutrition, address the environment, creating businesses, but selfless business. We don't want to make money out of it. I want to solve this problem. And I feel pleasure that I, as a human being, has the capacity to be of use to other people. For the first time, you are using your talent, your creativity for others, not for yourself, not for selfish reasons. So if you remain selfish, of course you suspect each other because everything is taken away. If we can 
expand the selflessness beyond business in politics also. It's not everything for my country, not everything for my city. I share it with everybody else. That's a selflessness. Maybe that kind of psyche will not need this kind of security that we have, or we are promising. So today, it's a question of restructuring. This is the deepest of the crisis today, of all those crises manifested in different ways. But this is the greatest of the opportunity to look back and redesign and look at this wall, what it taught us, that the impossible will happen anyway. Thank you very much.